yet, so that's probably good that we're here. But <clears throat> inside, I mean, it's of course it's good that we're here. Here, um, uh, the children may be dis- dismissed for Discovery Kids uh, and head downstairs, and the rest of us uh, are going to stand and sing together. Hear this opening scripture from Psalm 138. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. All right, please stand with us and and sing loud because there's only two of us.
through the first two songs of the post Evan era? All good. <laughs> All right, Pastor Paul is going to introduce our missionary for today. You can have a seat. Oh, don't sit down yet. Stay standing. Stay standing, Stay please. Standing. Hey, uh, good morning. And take a few moments. We've got name tags so we know our names. Uh, yes, that is who you are. You got it right. So you passed the test. You got your name right. So just take a few moments and greet the people around you. Let them know that you're glad they're here worshiping with you this morning. And then you can have a seat. Malcolm. Hi. Can you give me a bump? Mom. Okay, okay. Hey, at uh, 4 a.m. yesterday, Grand Rapids time, uh, Steve took off in a plane from Africa and hasn't gotten much rest yet. I was surprised he woke up this morning and he's here. But one of our missionary partners, Steve, is here and he ministers with World Renew, and he came to town for World Renew, and we are honored that he still has some time of time available to come and to meet with us. So uh, I've invited Steve, you come up and just share a bit about the ministry and what's going on in your family. So glad you could be here. All right, thank you so much. Good to be here again. I was here last, I'm not sure exactly. I actually left on Friday morning from Malawi uh, and arrived here yesterday afternoon. So uh, anyway, it's really good to be here. I don't have a formal presentation this time. I just grabbed a couple pictures, a few pictures from the last month, and so I just want to share those a little bit with you. The guy in the jacket on the right, his name is Cuthbert, and he's one of the people that I have the privilege of working with. He actually wrote the book on what's called the Church and Community Mobilization Process how churches can understand God's call and become more involved in their communities. Go to the next picture. That was just a month ago. So you gather people around and you start doing Bible studies. This is just a visit we were doing to, to that area um, about two hours from where I live in Malawi. And, and the church people start to do these Bible studies and understand that, that call of God to reach out and that God is, His Word is to impact every aspect of our life. It's not just something you do on Sundays. And so these churches will do these Bible studies and then they start saying, okay, what kind of act of love can we do? Who are the most vulnerable, vulnerable people in our area? And they start doing amazing things. Next picture. So this guy is Pastor Gibson. And Pastor Gibson, in 2017, started doing these Bible studies and just kind of went, wow. And so he started planting trees because one of the needs is, you know, there's a lot of deforestation happening and there's charcoal burning and those kinds of things. So he started planting trees wherever he could. He said that in their area now, uh, for, since 2017, they've planted approximately 9,000 trees, all with their own resources. And these are just some of them. He sells them. He wanted to donate some of those bigger trees when they were working on a new... The, the church was growing so much, they needed a bigger building. And so he was donating the rafters from his tree collection. And the church said, no, we're, we're actually going to pay you for that. So we don't want you to donate them to us. Next. Um, so they said, you know, this isn't just about our own community where we live, but where are some of the surrounding communities? And so they found this other place called Zico, not too far away. And there's no church in Zico. 
But the people from the church went to Zico and they said, you know, we've been learning about, about how God has given each of us so many resources. And so how about if we help you sort of do some resource mapping and talk about your problems here? And, and so the community gathered around and they said, you know, pretty recently this lady was, was about to give birth and she needed to go to the health center, which is across the river. And she didn't make it because she couldn't get across the river. So we really need a bridge. We need a bridge. And so they started working and they made a plan how we're going to do this for f- about four years. They saved their money and then they got together enough money to go and buy cement bags and to g- and collect rocks and to get some big logs and they made their own bridge entirely on their own. They said, we're tired of waiting for government and for other projects that might come to help. Nobody's doing it. We've been waiting for years. We're just going to do this. And so they built their own bridge and you can drive across it if you really wanted to. Next picture. But it's not just about physical things. This lady, as we, we went to a church and we gathered and we said, can you just tell us a bit about what's happened in your life since 2017? And she stood up and she starts talking about how um, her marriage has improved. They, they, she started learning more um, with her husband about, about how to have a better marriage and, and just went on about and talking about how her marriage has gotten so much better. The same day, there was also a widow who stood up and, and gave testimony. I can't remember if she had six or nine kids, one of those two, I can't remember. Uh, and she talked about how through the program she's been learning about, you know, caring for things and, and, and doing some permaculture kinds of things. And she's been able to put three of her children through university as a widow by applying the principles she's been learning through, through this church and community program. And I think that was the last one. Oh, wait, no, this is one, one more picture. There we go. Yeah, that's our team. Um, I oversee the team in Malawi, Mozambique, and Zambia. We had a chance to gather in August uh, in our office in Lilongwe and... We had lots of learning time. We went and visited some places and uh, had lots of time for discussion and just hanging out. And I am just so blessed to get to be a part of this ministry that God is working in, in Malawi and Mozambique and in Zambia. And the reason we can do it is because of people like you who are helping us and supporting us and praying for us. And I guess just want to say once again, thank you so much for standing with us for all these years since I've been in Malawi. Thank you. During our uh, prayer time, we will be lifting up Steve and ministry and his family in prayer. So uh, we'll take special time to be able to do that in just a little bit. During this fall season, we're doing a new series simply called Love One Another that uh, is tying in with our revisioning of what we believe God is calling us to do, to connect deeply, to follow intentionally, to serve justly. And we're looking at a wide variety of ways in which we are called to love one another. Last week we looked at a general call of God's call to love. Today we're looking more specifically at what he says in serving one another. And you might think that it's about a whole bunch of to-do lists I'm really kind of trying to take a step back with this talk and talk more about the why than about the how. God will speak the how to us in our situations. And I just want to take some time to kind of step back a little bit farther and look at the why. Why we are to serve one another. Our scripture passage is in the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 12. The first 12 verses, you can follow along. Uh, on your phone or tablet or simply listen to the words as I read them. I invite you to join with me by standing in spirit or in body in reverence to God and his word as we hear these words from the book that we love. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. 
For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, says the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. God's very word. Thanks be to God, and you may be seated. One of the descriptions of a Christian's walk is to walk on paths of righteousness. Maybe you've heard that phrase. It's a picture of sheep paths in the ancient Middle East, where you can look up a hill, and as you look up the hill, you can see there are lines going across. And if you would get closer, you would see that those lines really are little paths. Paths that have been formed not only by months, but years and decades and centuries of a shepherd leading his or her sheep from one field to another. They're called sheep paths. And the biblical writers talk about those as being paths of righteousness. Now we might get the idea or think that such paths are completely straight lines. You might get that from something like Isaiah 40, where we read, The voice of one calling, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Make straight in the desert. Now, paths of righteousness are not perfectly straight. Like a hiking path that we would go on. They zig and they zag, and they don't go in a perfectly straight line. Fairly straight, but not perfectly straight. Because the shepherd knows the way. He knows where the big boulders are. He knows where the nooks and crannies are. He knows where the holes are. He knows on that path which way to go so the sheep don't stumble. It's not about walking a straight path. It is all about following the way of the good shepherd. He goes to the right. We go to the right. If he goes to the left, we go to the left. The sheep know if they follow the good shepherd, they will be taken care of, and he will serve them well. The series of Love One Another is about following that path of the good shepherd. It's not in our power that we follow that path, but the power comes from remaining in communion with the good shepherd. And as we walk on the path, we don't walk on the path as individuals. We walk on the path together in community. And that's a big push that we have of doing it in community. And we know that community can be hard because we love our autonomy. We love to make decisions that are not influenced by others. You be you, I'll be me, and we'll each stay in our lane. That's what our society tells us. But when we read the Bible, the gospel upends us. It changes us. It changes us in the ways that we relate to God, we relate to one another, and we relate to the world. The gospel wants to move us away from being inward-focused, thinking just of ourselves, to being part of a people who love well, who love God well, who love each other well, loves the world well. Romans 12 is some of the building blocks of the new society founded by Jesus Christ, reshaping 
how it is that we are to serve one another. Chapter 12. Chapter 12 begins with the word, therefore. It is the hinge part of the book. Chapters 1 through 11 talk about deep theology. And now the writer, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Spirit, moves from theology to making the application of how this happens. Therefore, because of what God has done for us, he goes on to say, in view of God's mercy, as a result of all that Jesus Christ has done for us, because of the mercy and the grace of God, we who were once lost and homeless, in Jesus Christ we have been claimed and brought into God's forever family. Because of God's mercy, he goes on. Because of the gospel. Someone once characterized the gospel like this. The gospel is, we are more sinful than we dare believe. And at the same time, we are more loved and accepted than we have ever dared hope for. In light of that, that we have been so totally accepted by a wonderful, merciful God that says we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. God calls us to respond to his grace and to his mercy as a living sacrifice, as one sacrifice. Now, a reader of the first century if they were to read this, they would be a bit shaken and alarmed by the phrase, a living sacrifice. Religious people knew, Jewish people knew, that an animal sacrifice meant that the entire animal was to be killed. You don't simply sacrifice the sheep's leg. You don't simply sacrifice the sheep's tail. It's an all-or-nothing deal, right? We kind of get that. A sacrifice, as it was described in the Old Testament, and now as we go into the New Testament, is an all-or-nothing deal. You would never see an animal partially sacrificed on an altar, and then the animal would walk away. It never happened that way. Sacrifices were an all-or-nothing deal because it was to pay for something usually the cost of the sin of the one who brought the sacrifice, paying the price of God's judgment, appeasing God's justice for our sin. And this sacrifice allowed us to live. But a living sacrifice was rather different. When you bring a sacrifice, you cannot hold back. They said you don't sacrifice just part of the sheep's body. You bring the sheep, you hand it to the priest, and you let go. You relinquish any claim on that. You have no longer any control, any right to say what's going to happen to that goat or that sheep. You totally relinquish ownership and surrender its life to God. It's that way with a living sacrifice, too. When we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, same principles, we hold nothing back. We don't say to God, I'll give you my left hand, that's about all I'm willing to relinquish. No, it is a total and complete sacrifice. Your body is not your own. Your resources, your time, your finances, your home are no longer your own. A living sacrifice means your dreams and your things that you long for are no longer your own. To let all things go means that my entire life is an expression of praise and thanks to God. Unlike a dead sacrifice that's made once, a living sacrifice is made every day, every hour, every moment, right? We give our life, 
our home, our belongings, our resources, our time, our finances, over and over and over again. We relinquish them. Putting to death the instinct of self. In light of God's mercy, this is our pro- an appropriate response to God. To surrender all we are and all we have every day. And yet there's something that's a little peculiar about this passage. I thought I would just gloss over it and just kind of push it to the side. I'm not sure I have a full handle on it. But I really feel compelled that when we come to a passage, you know, that we struggle with or don't fully understand, he calls us to wrestle with it, right? Because that's how we grow. It says, verse 1, Brothers and sisters, plural, give yourself as a living sacrifice, singular. We often, at least for me, would often think of that verse, verse 1, brothers and sisters, offer your body as living sacrifices. That seems to make sense, right? Uh, Tony's body is a living sacrifice. Reed's body is a living sacrifice. Stephanie's body is a living sacrifice. That, that's often how we think about it. Present yourselves, brothers and sisters, as living sacrifices. But it doesn't say that. It says, as a living sacrifice. So I wrestled and tossed with, what does that mean? That as a plural, we offer him one singular sacrifice. I'm not sure I got a total handle on it myself, but I do believe that what it means is that as God relates to us, He relates to us not only as individuals, but just as much as a community. Just as much as a family. Maybe He's saying as a family, as a community, as a local church, what you do is a living sacrifice. The commitment that we make to one another, the commitments we make to God, that's a living sacrifice. Not a whole bunch of sacrifices, but it's pulled together as one sacrifice of the community. And that really goes counter to our culture, right? Because our world says that you develop a sense of self by self-expression to try to understand yourself. The Bible says, though, that our sense of self is found in relationship to one another. That when we are with one another, that that helps us to understand who we are. We know ourselves as we get to know each other, and we know that through relationship. The sacrifice of the community, not through isolation. I was trying to think of a couple of examples. We are all here this morning when we could be somewhere else, or we're watching when we could be somewhere else. Now, we could say that uh, being here, we're sacrificing something else. But most of us would say, being here is not a sacrifice, because I want to be here, right? God has so worked in us in that way. We don't see coming here as a sacrifice. But just go along with me, right? We have given something up in order to be here today. It's not a... Following verse 1, could it be that our coming together is a communal sacrifice, one sacrifice of the body. Just one sacrifice. Now, we all have a certain place in that, but it's just one sacrifice. Or when we do the mobile food truck that's going to happen again this, this Wednesday, uh, someone packs the food in the cards, someone brings the cards, someone's checking it in. We're all doing our sacrifices. We're all doing the thing. But in following Romans 12:1, could it be that it's just one sacrifice. The work of the church is serving through the mobile food truck our neighbors. One sacrifice. I'm not sure I got a handle on it. 
where it seems to be saying there is something about serving together, serving each other, where God is doing a work to say, that's the expression I'm looking for of my body. We talk about one family, we talk about one body, we talk about one church. Could one sacrifice fit in there as well? If you've got a handle on it, then please uh, share that with me during our, our meal time. But he's saying there's something about one sacrifice of the body and the family. And maybe we all have a part in it, but it's one sacrifice that the body is making. He talks about what those sacrifices are in Romans 12. That last section of verses that I read are ten commands. Ten commands of how we are to relate to one another. How we are to serve one another. They're not suggestions. The way that it's written, it's written in a command form. Where else in the Bible do we find Ten Commandments? God's Ten Commandments to Moses, right? Could it be that the Spirit is adding or deepening or refreshing these commands to show that the thrust of following Jesus is not just how I follow him individually, but how we follow him collectively. How we love one another. How we show hospitality to one another. How we think more highly of others than we think of ourselves. And the service and the sacrifice that we make is the sacrifice of being a part of a community, of a body, of a family, of a church. There is something in these verses to talk about in the surrendering of ourselves to God, we do so in community. And there are some great blessings that come from community that we don't get from isolation. How would you know that you're a talented dancer? Well, you dance in front of other people and you get their feedback. How would you know that a certain job might be good for you and, and how God wired you? Well, you get input from other people who know you, right? And say, well, you're a, a, a people person. Why would you be stuck in the back of a warehouse? A close community will affirm whether you are someone who is good in the arts or someone who is good in math or someone who is good in the sciences or whatever. And it comes from our interaction from one another. There is a blessing that comes from the community. So Paul provides a vision here as he is inspired by the Spirit. Not a life of self-centeredness, but a life of community and care. A life in which we are deeply enriched through a deeply connected community. One sacrifice. Where we are responsible for each other, connected to each other, accountable for one another. One people, one family, one church, one sacrifice. Now, you know as well as I do that if you live a life of completely sacrificing yourself for others. Sometimes we just can't muster up enough, right? Sometimes we just run out of gas. And that's why there's another part to the sacrifice of the serving, and that is where the power comes from. So if you're following through on the outline, we're moving to the second point, to that of the power. It's challenging to sacrifice, as the Bible calls us, because relationships can be hurtful at times, right? They can be hurtful, and they can be hurtful even within the family. The earliest brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. And then we have Esau and Jacob. Esau wanted to kill Jacob. Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers over a coat. And then we run into the New Testament. The older brother and the younger 
prodigal brother don't quite get along. It can be hard to serve each other, and especially those that we are called to be close to. Even Jesus. I mean, even Jesus was rejected by his family, right? We remember that story. At the beginning of the ministry, we, we read the phrase that a prophet is not welcomed in his hometown. And then we come to Mark 3, where he's teaching, and he's inside this house, and, and the house is full, and his family, his blood brothers and family is outside. And they send word that they want Jesus. They want to bring him home because they think there's something not quite right with Jesus and what he's doing. And then Jesus' brilliant response, right? Who are my brothers and sisters? Those who are here. Jesus says he's recreating family. A family that our hearts yearn for. Not just an ancestry family, but a family of faith. Many of us have an ancestral family. We call that the bloodline. There is another bloodline that is equally important, and that is the bloodline of Jesus, right? Hebrews 12. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. He voluntarily went to the cross to pay for the ways that I have failed and failed miserably. He came to pay for that by spilling his blood. And by spilling his blood, he took on all the hurt and the pain that was caused by my sinfulness against God. And his blood offers forgiveness for me and for you and for anyone. He is the mediator of the new covenant, a new bloodline. And he gives us the kind of family that our hearts desire and yearn for. Shocking, but true. Jesus talks about a new family, a family of faith. We are sisters, we are brothers, we are called to serve together. We've been brought into a family by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then we have a Father, Father God. The Bible suggests that the love of God is greater than the love of a nursing mother for her child. That is a deep and instinctual love, isn't it? I I don't know what love you can describe that, that is more powerful. And yet, it says the love of the Father is greater than that. In Jesus, we have the love that our hearts so want, and we experience that love. And he calls us to take that love and to serve each other. To serve each other in our community of faith. To serve each other in the community where we're planted and where we live. There is a person who is closer than a brother. His name is Jesus. There is a father who brings us into his new family, Father God. And there is a spirit who tells us time and again, Here is your sister, and here is your brother, and here is your mother. And if you think that the Father's love can be matched, Isaiah 49. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will never forget you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a singular living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true 
and proper worship. And so, Father God, we bless you for your deep love for us. And sometimes when we think that we know about love, we thank you for that, and at the same time we bless you for a love that is far greater. Thank you for the love that brought Jesus to the cross and the love that raised him from the dead. Thank you for bringing us into your family. And we pray that you will give to us the power of your Spirit that we might love and serve you well, our brothers and sisters well, and our world well. We pray for families that are hurting, hurting for a variety of reasons, relationally, financially, they're carrying the burden. We pray for our families. We pray that you will lift them up, that they can experience your presence and your grace. And Father, this morning we lift up Steve and the ministry of World Renew. We bless you for this ministry that reaches out to the four corners of the world in word and deed. We bless you for Steve and his family and for the ministry that they have in South Central Africa. We pray for his family as you will provide for them. We pray for Tim as he begins his boarding school in Kenya. We pray for Katya that you will indeed bring healing and health to her legs and to her nerves. And for Beth and the other two, that you will provide your care and provision for them. We pray that you will bless the week that World Renew has together and that you will empower them and inspire them to continue to serve you well and to serve others well. Thank you once again for your great love. And as best we know how, we offer ourselves to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed and said, Amen. Uh, it's been a, a practice of discovery to spend a minute, give or take, uh, the quiet moment, thinking about a piece of scripture, uh, a question, um, what's on your heart, what's on, what the Lord is putting in your mind. Um, and I'd like to do that today. Um, I have a verse that I'll read from Romans 12, but also... Um, Maybe it's something from what Paul said uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, maybe it's about uh, how the gospel changes us. Or what it means to be a living sacrifice, relinquishing ownership, surrendering to God. Or a communal sacrifice. Uh, or being a part of God's family through Jesus' bloodline in unity with the Spirit. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a minute. I'm going to read a verse and give you a minute to, to think, listen. Uh, and whatever's on your heart, bring it to the Lord. Romans 12, 10 and 11. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord.
be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Uh, I want to respond. I want us to respond today uh, to what Paul had to say uh, to our quiet moment um, with a little bit of talk time. Uh, Actually, we'll call it listen time today. Uh, So, uh, gather with the people around you. Feel free to move your chairs uh, and um, do some listening. Um, Listen to uh, maybe what the Lord put on someone's heart during this quiet moment. Or uh, maybe what they heard in what Paul was saying. Or maybe it's how they found their identity in this body of believers. Uh, Or maybe it's uh, what they wrote on their name tag about seeing an act of service this week. Uh, So we'll take a few minutes. Go ahead and move your chairs around as you see fit. And uh, after that, you don't need to move back uh, because we're just going to sing a couple songs. We'll sing them as a body.
one you might have to scooch together a little bit as you you know as you're comfortable uh, for my friends may you grow in grace uh, because it doesn't work if you're spread out the song we just can't hear it so you have to like beat you know that's not how it works but you know how it works my friends So first of all, you can stick around after, well, after now, for a family meal and uh, stay until uh, about 1.30 to be part of our retreat follow-up that the leadership team is hosting. Whether you came through the retreat or not, please stay and be part of this two-hour participation time. That was participation time, not a sit and listen time, a participation time to hone in on what our vision, if lived out well, in the next 12 months can look like. Uh, and you heard uh, Paul talk about the mobile food pantry, which is this Wednesday from 5 to 6. Uh, and if you can help, please be here by 4.30. And uh, there is an electronic sign-up sheet that you can sign up there. That, pro- that should be in an email coming this week. And also related to mobile food pantry, uh, this month, September 21, that would be uh, this Wednesday, we'll begin a change where the food truck is going to be in the northwest corner of the parking lot and the cars will enter from Eastern rather than leave from Eastern. Uh, it's probably safer that way to be exiting onto 72nd Street. Uh, so whether you're going to be here this month or next month, uh, please enter off Eastern and park in the southwest corner of the parking lot. That is uh, one of these four corners over here. Uh, don't ask me which one. I'm not that good at direction. Southwest, over there. Over there, that one. Okay, good. Uh, then, 
Uh, number three, the elders have put together a search team to get the worship director job description out and to gather resumes. If you know of someone that you would like to apply for the position, the job description is on the church website and can be sent by the church administrator uh, to someone that you might know. Uh, resumes can be sent to the church administrator's email at discoverycrc at gmail.com. And finally, excuse me, um, the, there's going to be a Harvest Chili Cook-Off on Saturday, October 29 at Discovery Church. Bring your favorite chili so it can be shared with others, uh, especially me. Um, <laughs> we will be voting for favorite chili. It doesn't, it doesn't say best chili. It says favorite chili, so it, it might be subjective. That's fine. Um, there will be other special activities for children who do Discovery Kids on Sundays. Uh, and we'll have a few games for the youth and adults who might want the youth and the adults who act like youth or who don't act like youth that might want to join in. So bring your family and friends on October 29. Did I miss anything? Great. <laughs> we learned a, a little different way of saying it but I thank God for you or I thank God for what you've done and uh, so we thank God for you Tony and we look forward to uh, more Sundays where Tony is going to provide worship leadership for us. Uh, Jacob Baker is going to help in as well. So Jacob will be having some time and we'll also be having a few uh, outside worship leaders come. Uh, Christopher is going to be stepping up as well on the keyboard. So we uh, bless God for Christopher and his willingness to step up and to help in that way. So please, uh, even if you don't stay for the discussion afterwards, please stay for the meal is to be delivered at any moment. So uh, we need your help. We need to bring, uh, I don't know, maybe six round tables. They're up on the landing. If we can bring you know, like six round tables and set them up, maybe bring two more and just kind of put them to the side in case so that we eat our uh, meals uh, at the round tables with each other and then we can have our participation around the round tables as well. So if you can help with uh, those round tables and getting them down, getting them set up and the chairs around, that would be great. Now, people of God, family of Christ, receive this parting blessing. May the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessing of Father God, the Holy Spirit's grip of grace upon you, Rest upon you, be upon you, wrap around you, now and forevermore. Now all of God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.